I'll give him a D. You know, it's like giving the arsonist a good gr- a grade for putting out the fire. Right? He, he never should have left rates so low and kept QE going in 21 and, you know, and, and not done anything about it till he did. And I think that was the huge mistake. Now he may look like a hero, but it's a hero of his sort of, I mean, of his own making. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. I'm your host for this discussion today. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation because it's with Michael Leibowitz. He's with Real Investment Advice and he's a portfolio manager over there. And uh, you might remember we had his colleague, Lance Robertson, on the program in the past before as well. Really, really great discussion. So I'm hoping and I'm knowing that we're going to repeat this because uh, we've got so much new data to discuss. And uh, I really want to know where things are headed. Are we in a trampoline economy? Is everything great, like the GDP number recently suggested? Or uh, are we are we in for a world of hurt come uh, U.S. election time as well? So lots and lots to discuss. And uh, before I switch over to my guest, quick reminder, hit that subscribe button. Only takes a second. Doesn't hurt. And uh, if you find this inv- information valuable, we find it valuable if you hit that subscribe button. Really appreciate that. Now, let me introduce my guest. And uh, Michael, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining me here. Oh, you're welcome. It's great to be here. Absolutely. No, really looking forward to this, uh, to this discussion. As I said, we have lots to discuss. Uh, we got now two inflation readings. We had the Fed speak recently as well. And uh, we get revised GDP numbers this week as well, which uh, came in stronger and uh, we're revised upwards as well. So um, let's start with the state of the economy, Michael. How, how strong is the economy right now and how healthy is it? The economy is strong. The economic data coming out, like you just said, GDP was just revised higher again. Uh, most of the economic data we see is robust. It points to a good economy. Now, regarding how, you know, the infrastructure of the economy, that's not quite as robust. You know, we know there's still stimulus from the pandemic floating around the system. Um, We know that consumers' behaviors have changed a little bit. So they've been spending more, saving less. Uh, borrowing more. That's not a sustainable equation. Uh, So there are some concerns, but they're not concerns for today. I think as the year goes on, some consumer instability will probably appear. And if the unemployment rate ticks up, that will become magnified. So something to watch out. But but no, the the economy is, is good right now sustainability is a different issue. And, you know, the other thing to focus on, I can't believe I forgot this, is the current deficits are huge compared to what's going on in the economy. So that's also helping prop up the economy, which again, it's not unsustainable, but for it to be sustainable requires a lot of work by the Fed. No, ab- absolutely. And I think the, the Fed is working hard, although, although it seems like they're not doing anything. Um, l- l- let's start there. Like, how, how much do you agree with the stance there that, that Powell has taken recently, that uh, we're not going to cut rates for now and uh, we're going to keep them higher for longer, maybe? What, uh, what, what's your well, opinion on that? Well, I think, well, here's what's interesting. If we go back to September, October of last year, the Fed was still leaning towards hiking rates. And at that time, financial conditions were tight and obviously borrowing conditions were tight. Once they kind of made that shift October, November, and ultimately in December, they basically said no more rate cuts and we're looking at cutting rates three times in 2024. Uh, Financial conditions ease significantly. Borrowing conditions remain very tight. Interest rates didn't really come down that much, um, but financial conditions ease significantly. So what are financial conditions? You know, it can be defined in a number of different ways. But if you look at how the Fed defines it, it's stock prices, it's stock volatility, it's credit spreads. That's three of the the big five components. The other one are is uh, interest rates is another big one in the dollar. Dollar hasn't really gone anywhere, so let's toss that out. Uh, interest rates have come down marginally. So, you know, on the margin, it's easing financial conditions, but stock prices, stock volatility, and credit spreads all point to much easier conditions. And, you know, we know that when investors are have great sen- sentiment about the markets, uh, 
when people read in the headlines that the Dow, the S&P, whatever you follow is going up and up and up and setting new records, it improves consumer sentiment, which means more spending. So what's interesting is the Fed is shifting to a dovish tone, i.e. rate cuts, you know, whether they're in the middle of the year or later in the year, degrees of dovishness, but they're doing it while inflation has become sticky, the economy is robust, and financial conditions have eased significantly. So that's, you know, I think that's a pretty important thing to keep in mind here. Lots of, lots of good points you make there, Michael, and I, I want to follow up with a few. And uh, you, you mentioned easing of financial conditions. The question is, though, like how tight or how easy is money right now? Because if I look at you well, know the, the stock market, money doesn't seem to be tight because everything seems to be flowing into certain stocks and there seems to be a lot of liquidity let's slash money around so so what is liquidity i mean i think that's the that's the big question liquidity i think in a very short run is a function of sentiment it, it is a big deal and then kind of more general liquidity so if we think about sentiment Liquidity isn't really produced, it's generated, whether it's the banks or investors. So if I sit on all my money in cash, I'm not providing any liquidity to the market. However, if I start buying stocks or bonds or whatever I'm buying, I'm providing liquidity to the market. So some of that is just sentiment of investors, both retail and institutional. And then there's a function of what the banks are doing. How are they, you know, to what degree are they lending money? So when the Fed does QE, they're putting reserves on the bank balance sheets. Reserves are basically the fodder for the banks to make loans. And when they make loans, they're creating money, which is generating liquidity. But at the end of the day, the Fed can do whatever they want. If banks don't make loans, the Fed's actions aren't creating more liquidity. So right now, the banks are, they're not, you know, the loans that they're making, we're, we see commercial and industrial loans have actually declined mortgage, the mortgage market is just non-existent right now. There's just not a lot of activity and consumer loans are starting to decline decently. Um, so, so it seems like a lot of that liquidity is being kind of shot over to the financial markets, speculation margin, you know, what have you. So uh, liquidity is fine right now. It's good. Uh, but I think we are running into a problem in a few months on the liquidity front. Just a quick, you know, some, something that I just thought of as well, like the announcement by the Fed is that we're going to cut rates. Isn't that holding back the market automatically saying, well, I'm just going to wait for lower rates. Why should I really force myself into refinancing now or take out a mortgage? Um, isn't there the anticipated antici anticipation of lower rates sort of... Uh, uh, pu putting pressure on those markets, like as you said, like lo mortgage mortgage market is down, consumer credit market is down. If I was the consumer and somebody told me, "Well, it's going to be cheaper next week," like why would I consume and uh, apply for credit or a mortgage well, uh, today? Well, well, I mean, the problem, like in a mortgage market, the problem is there's six houses for sale. There are no <laughs> houses for sale. So if you re if you really want to buy a house, you just buy the house today, you take on that 7% mortgage, knowing that you can refinance it in six months or a year or whatever. So I don't really think that's stopping so much the mortgage market. Credit cards are already 22%. Do, do, you know, if you're borrowing money at 21, 22, 23%, does going down to 18% make a difference? You know, probably not. And, you know, same with auto loans. They're, they're kind of all over the place, but generally they're 7 to 10%. So maybe they come down, but when you need a car, you need a car. And that's not really an option to wait another year or two. Um, so I don't think that's done. But what I think is interesting, again, why are they talking about cutting rates and reducing QT when everything is hunky dory? And I think the answer to that is that they sense a liquidity problem coming. And, you know, why, why, you know, a couple of minutes ago, I said, I think in a couple of months, two, three, four months, there could be a liquidity problem. And that's because the Fed's reverse repo program will likely dwindle down to zero. And that program represents excess liquidity in the market. And I think that's when things may change for the markets, for the banking system, for the economy, unless the Fed does something. So it, it almost seems like they're prepping the markets they're aware of the problem. They, they've mentioned it. Powell said something at his last press conference. Other Fed members have, have, have talked about it. So I think they're prepping the markets 
for a rate cuts and trying to trying to get the markets comfortable with the rate cuts while inflation is still sticky and high because that's a tough that's a tough thing to balance and and not upset markets that you know not not get the markets to worry that there's more inflate that what they're doing is inflationary so we'll see how good a juggling act they can do um what kind of school grade would you give jerome powell and the fed these days if you had to rate them i've asked that question a couple of guests and i'm curious what your answer on that uh on that front is i'll give him a d you know it's <laughs> like giving the arsonist a good gr a grade for putting out the fire right he, he never should have left rates so low and kept qe going in 21 and you know and and not done anything about it till he did and i think that was the huge mistake now he may look like a hero but it's a hero of his sort of i mean of his own making and you know the fed should have done something in early 2020 the economy was shut down i, I get that but the the how long he extended both qe and zero rates was very irresponsible and now he's taken action which i applaud but uh, I think it's this all could have been not all avoided, but the degree of inflation that we got could have been avoided. Of course, if you flood the money, uh, there, there were a money, lot of like, yeah. I mean, there were supply problems that he has no control over, which definitely boosted inflation. But the demand side also boosted it. No, absolutely. The transitory discussion was it was an interesting one that we had numerous times here on the channel. And people said, well, it's not transitory, it's sticky. Yeah, it is sticky, but only at around 3%, right? So mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, let, let, let's stay on the inflation topic a little bit longer. Like, how do you see inflation develop here? Because we've got two higher readings in January and February than expected. I was at 3.1 and 3.2%. How, how sticky is inflation? Or do you see it actually going higher or lower right now? I see it going lower. Um, uh, the way I kind of think about the economy, inflation, and kind of everything is that we've had some pretty solid trends intact from roughly 1980 to 2020, and then COVID upset everything. And, you know, for the first time since the early eighties, we saw an outbreak of inflation. We saw, you know, we've seen some very strong economic growth following the pandemic, uh, but I think once all the stimulus is out of the system, we resort back to those trends. And, you know, if you remember back 2019, 18, 17 and years before, inflation was 2 percent or below 2 percent and slightly trending lower over time. Economic growth was, you know, trending lower. In fact, the Fed's projections for economic growth are still one point, you know, for the future are still, I believe it's 1.7, 1.8, 1.9 percent. So they, too, think that that trend is intact. So, you know, I think there is some stickiness in inflation. Some of it is seasonal. Some of it, you know, with the new year and, you know, things like insurance. But you look at CPI, 40 percent of it is shelter, is rent. It's basically rent, whether it's actual rent or imputed rent. And we know that rents in the real world are, much, are coming down much quicker than they are in the CPI figures. And the way CPI calculates the number, we know that it's just a matter of time before CPI reflects, again, 40% of CPI reflects lower rents. And Powell, too, tells us this. Every meeting, he seems to remind us that the number is probably higher than it really is if we were to use actual data. So I think that we're still, the Fed will soon enough be dealing with a disinflationary, deflationary problem the same problem they've had for the last 20 years before covid michael how much money is left in the system because of the stimulus and do you see any money new money coming in right now um just as an example in terms of new money i've seen intel announce a massive uh, plan to build out or build uh, chip factories in four states uh mm -hmm. getting massive grants of up to 50 billion dollars isn't that uh you know flooding the market again with uh, with liquidity because and, and and extra cash through the back door yeah, sure. There is, you know, again, the Fed, the the Treasury is running deficits. But here's the important to thing to in economics, everything or most everything we talk about as growth rates. We don't talk about absolute numbers, right? Everyone knows how much the economy grew as a percentage, but we don't really know how many trillion the GDP is. Um, so it's growth. So if the government runs a deficit of two trillion this year and two trillion next year, they're running the same deficit, meaning that their contribution to the economy next year 
is zero on a percentage basis. So, so the question, you know, we have to be looking at when we kind of think about how the deficits are boosting the economy is, well, how is it different from last year? Or how will next year be different from this year? And the deficits are very high, but they're projected, and we all know how those projections go, but they're projected to be about the same this year as it was last year, as it will be next year, give or take a little. So that extra stimulus from the deficit is going to be much less effective unless they spend more money. I've started focusing on macro discussions probably in the August, in August of 2022. And we've always been looking for a case that sort of puts the uh, where the economy crumbles pretty much, right? We're always been looking for the straw that breaks the camel's back and it has yet to appear. Of course, two two years is not really a long time frame um, of, of doing that, but uh, like, I, I I want, I want to build maybe a positive scenario here as well, because mm -hmm. like, how can you grow uh, grow GDP? How can you sort of uh, sustain or um, you know prolong the suffering that we're in right now? Um, I, I, what are some of the factors that could actually prevent a crash right now? Like GDP, you mentioned, and I've mentioned in the intro, is higher than expected, and uh, you know the debt to GDP ratio is an important indicator for many to to, to look at. If we grow GDP, maybe we can grow debt even further. Is that something? Um, that could prolong that? It's like, are we in a Goldilocks economy right now and everything's fine? Well, today we're in a Goldilocks economy. That doesn't mean yeah. we're going to be in one in six months from now, but we certainly are right now. And that's why sentiment in the markets is so high. That's why speculation has become so rampant because everything's perfect. Uh, <laughs> you know, his economics history teaches us that economies go through cycles. This cycle is prolonged. Uh, can it stay prolonged? Sure. The government can keep propping up the economy with deficits. Consumer sentiment can stay strong. And as long as the unemployment rate stays low, and look, we can believe the BLS or not on what they say it is, but we do know that that jobs are plentiful, right? We, You know, you, you ask your friends, you ask other people, who do you know people have lost jobs? The answer is usually not many, right? So regardless of what the BLS tells us, the the labor situation is is decent. And when, when the labor markets are good, people feel good about spending money. When the markets are rising, hitting new records, people feel good about spending money. So, you know, we may just continue to float with this good, strong, robust growth. And, and, that, and then you have the Fed that may cut rates into this. So, you know, this could be prolonged for a while, but at the end of the day, economy cycle, and this too is part of a cycle, whether it's a stretched out cycle or not, we'll, we'll know at some point in the future, but it's not a permanent uh, plateau that we're on. No. Now, well, a co couple of things like GDP productivity, of course, uh, or productivity or labor productivity is a big contributor to, to GDP, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're seeing a resurgence or not just a resurgence, but maybe an industrial revolution. What is it now? 3.0, 4.0 with AI. Um, I'm curious, like, do, do you see labor productivity even increase in a way that uh, it is meaningful enough to, to have an impact on GDP here and uh, maybe, um, have, you know, prolong uh, the current uh, environment? I think it's temporary. And, you know, what I, you know, the, a lot of the, the stimulus and everything else that's happened over the last time, the last few years has created a boost to productivity. Um, but I just don't think any of it's sustainable unless we really change the way that we want to focus on debt. If we start borrowing money and put it towards productive uses or more so towards productive uses, then yeah, productivity can rise, can increase. That, that would be perfect. That's what we should all be rooting for. But there's nothing that tells us that debt won't continue to be used for speculative purposes that that really don't pay any future benefits, but put an onus on the economy in the future. So, you know, I just think pro these little gains in productivity are very short lived. And it, Christopher Waller from the Fed came out, uh, I think it was last night. And I actually tweeted this this morning. He's saying the same exact thing. He goes, well, it's nice to see. And I hope it's I hope it's somewhat permanent. My guess is that this is just a temporary blip until productivity, you know, the, the productivity growth rate has also been declining for the last 30, 40 years, which is why the economy, economic growth has been, the growth rate has been declining and why inflation has been gently coming down, you know, prior to the pandemic on a downward trend. 
So, so no, again, no, no. I think all those pre-COVID trends reassert, reassert themselves over time. Just myself and most other prognosticators have, did not fully uh, appreciate how long this uh, blip may last, this transitory blip may last. No. Well, the, the, the very famous lag effect, right, that everybody seems to be talking about. So right. until it really gets wiped out of the system here. Um, one, one topic I quickly want to talk about as well is income growth, because it seems to be offsetting a lot as well. Uh, income growth is roughly 5%. Uh, if you use the real, um, you know, uh, inflation numbers, we're at 3.2%. So we're outpacing inflation with uh, income growth. Um, how, how much longer do you see income growing at that rate? I'm just throwing in here $20 per hour at McDonald's down in California, for example, right? Um, um, how much longer is that sustainable and, uh, and well, how much longer do you see income growing like that? California is a great example that those restaurants are starting to lay off people. So it's not sustainable. You know, earnings can't really grow much more than the economy unless companies are willing to take margin hits. Right. That, that's the or cut costs somewhere else, which has a negative effect on the economy. So I don't think that's really sustainable and look we see it in the jolts data and other data that shows us the labor market is not the quits rate the labor market is not really as not nearly as tight as it was and when the labor market's not tight it's harder to ask for a raise and get it it's harder to quit your job because you know you can get a new job paying more so i think over time we start to see wages come back down to the level wage growth come back down to the level inflation or even below it no it's uh, just observed it again i was in the us the last couple of days and uh, of course went to a couple of fast food restaurants and uh, frontline workers have all been replaced with displaced and uh, like right. you, you order yourself right so right, right. uh and def i don't think the the overall staff count like it, the front staff count definitely decreased. Like I did see more people in the back than I've usually seen or so, right? So that's obvious. Right. It's being it's being replaced. Um, right. And and if not, they'll cut costs somewhere else. They have to cut costs to offset the wage increases. So maybe they'll order less equipment, which means that some that what you don't see is, well, who's not working at the equipment manufacturer? Right. So, you know, there's the seen and the unseen. It's easy to go into a McDonald's and see the effect. But what you don't see is the downstream effect. No, no absolutely. No, that's a good statement there as well, because um, we always you know, pay attention to what we see. And uh, if, if you don't right. see it, you don't you don't re uh, realize it as well. Um, we need to talk about the U.S. deficit as well and how much longer the U.S. can uh, you know, out, outspend uh, its income uh, as well. And uh, we're in election season as well. So the question is, at what point does it become political, if, if, if at all? And uh, when do the alarm bells really start ringing out loud? I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> is this time really different than any other time in the last 30, 40 years? Every politician talks to it, yet every time it comes up for a vote, just about every politician votes for more spending, right? We've just been through this cycle one more time um, where, you know, you had two parties, one's comfortable with the spending, one's not, yet they seem to agree on more spending. Um, I don't see Trump or Biden addressing that issue, you know, depending on which one wins the election. You know, I think the deficit, the deficit helps politicians get get reelected uh, for the most part. The more they spend, the more, the better the economy is, the better their chance of reelection. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just think deficits, as we've seen, you know, pretty much for our entire lifetimes are, will continue in the future and they probably will be bigger. Uh, but it's important to put numbers into perspective. Deficit, you know, $1.8 trillion deficit is a big deficit, but the economy has grown significantly too over the last four or five years. So, you know, you have to be careful not to say, wow, they're spending two, two and a half trillion. If you have a, you know, the economy growing at a significant clip, it's, you know, it's still a big number, but it's, it can be not paid for, but there's more supporting it. No, no, absolutely. There, but, but, uh, I just but, lost but, my headphones for some reason. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but Mike, um, just just trying to things just throw me off a little bit here as well. But um, 
de deficits, like uh, interest on deficits as well. well like so, we're so that's the now, so the bigger. Right? I think the bigger problem is the interest on the deficit. That's easy to fix, but basically, how do they fund the deficits? Right. That that's the bigger question because you know we've seen some bad bond auctions. We've seen certainly higher yields in Treasuries, and we've seen Treasuries trading at a higher premium to inflation than they typically do. So potentially some of that talks to supply pressures, right? And if the government is going to keep pouring debt into the market, somehow it's got to be absorbed. Um, you know, and, and I think that happens a number of ways. The, first of all, the Fed will likely lower interest rates and, and, the re and all interest rates will probably fall with it as the economy normalizes, which takes that interest expense back down a little bit, um, which will alleviate the deficit. But look, at the end of the day, the Fed has become a slave to the government and they have increasingly been called upon to help fund the government. You know, prior to today, it was done with QE and it was done with lower interest rates. I think going forward, there's potentially newer methods. Uh, you know, I wrote an article recently calling it QE version two. And basically my guess, and again, this is a guess, some of it is based on rumor, some of it is just putting pieces together, is that banks are basically going to be told that they don't have to hold leverage or capital for tre for treasury loans. So a bank, right now a bank has to hold capital for a treasury uh, bond. And that limits how many bonds they can own, own base, basically based on how many deposits they have. Uh, but as we saw for about a year in 2020, from I think it was like May May 2020 to May or April 2021, those restrictions were taken off. So a bank, in theory, could then own as many treasuries as they want. That's step one. That that doesn't that that alleviates some of the issue. But step two is potentially well, how do they fund it? And how do they ensure that those will be profitable? Right, because bond prices move up and down. And last uh, March we saw that BTFP bank bailout basically bank funding program and that that program really resurrected and kind of maybe some tweaks made to it could be a per a, a perfect funding mechanism for the banks which basically if you put that together with the no leverage in not only allows but incentivizes banks to own as many treasuries as they possibly can so it's a form of QE because a BTFP type program ends up on the Fed's balance sheet, but they're not directly buying more buying uh, treasuries. The banks are doing the dirty work for them. You know, same thing, doing the same thing, but uh, I think it can be sold to the public differently and may not be perceived as inflationary as QE is currently. What is stopping the U.S. from going the way of Japan? Let's, uh, let's really bring Japan into the discussion so, here as well, because so, Japan has been buying treasuries like crazy, and they've even buy, <laughs> bought stocks in the market as well. So uh, what what is stopping that from happening? So let's go back, what was it, 30, 40 years? You know, the, the late 1980s. Japan had a massive, like, a massive bubble in real estate and stock prices. A bubble that, if you think we're in a bubble now, we're in a depression compared to the bubble they had. <laughs> Um, land prices were through the roof. Um, I, I think they said the land, I may be wrong on this, but the land, the value of the land in Japan was four times that of the U S but the U S has something like 25 or 30 times more acreage than Japan. It, it was just astronomical. Um, the land under the, uh, one, I forgot the name of the palace. One of the big palaces in Tokyo was, was worth more than all the land in the state of California. I mean, just some crazy statistics on what happened. And it was a function of over leverage and speculation. They've been bailing themselves out of that bubble ever since. Um, they basically, they didn't, you know, they, I think they, they felt they had a choice on the hand. They could have a massive depression potentially worse than what we saw in the 30s, or they could just try to slowly work themselves out of this crisis. 
and they chose to slowly work themselves out of crisis path. And they kept the banks alive. The banks wrote, wrote off debt, but they couldn't write off enough. They weren't lending money. And their, their GDP is actually slightly lower than where it was in like the mid early 1990s. So they've just had complete stagnation and a lot of, a lot of debt issuance by the government which has been supplemented by the Bank of Japan, buying, you know, via QE, they, they not only buy their treasuries, but they buy corporate bonds and they buy stock ETFs. Um, they kept interest rates zero or even below zero for long periods of time. Um, but, uh, you know, Japan is structurally different, A, because they had that massive bubble and a lot of the reasons for their problems are because they let that bubble get out of control and now they're paying a the price for it. Their demographics are much worse in this country. Um, they don't have the reserve cur currency, so they don't have other countries lending them money like we do. Um, and it's a much smaller nation. Uh, they don't really allow immigration to any large degree. We do, which we can debate immigration all day, but it helps the economy. Uh, more workers, more money made, more things produced, more consumption, et cetera. Uh, doesn't necessarily help it GDP per person, but it helps the overall number. Uh, so I think there's a lot of differences. And, and, you know, we talk about our debt to GDP at about what, 120, 130 percent theirs is like 270 percent so they're they're much more advanced in this bubble game in this debt debt bubble game than we are and they're also a very different country in terms of the way they think their their things they produce uh, a whole host of uh, factors that I don't I, I think we're kind of going down that path but it's not an imminent where we're going to be in where Japan is. I think that takes many, many years, decades, potentially. And there are many ways we could still fix this situation if we chose. No, absolutely. Just just on the topic of Japan here as well, Michael, is, uh, they've recently, as you, as you mentioned, increased their interest rates back to zero. <laughs> um, so it is zero interest rate environment there. But I think uh, the symbolism behind it could be interesting. And we talked about liquidity here earlier as well. Do you see that uh, interest rate change affect global liquidity flows at all, especially out of the US back into Japan? Not yet. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, people a lot of non-Japanese that borrow in yen and then take those yens, convert them to dollar and put them in the U.S. market. So that's a source of liquidity. There's also a lot of Japanese individuals and pension funds that take their Japanese yen, convert it to dollars and invest in higher yielding dollar assets. So, so the risk is that that so-called carry trade, the yen carry trade goes away. But unless the yen strengthens and interest rates go up in Japan, that carry trade isn't going anywhere. It's going to stay. And in fact, it could grow. Uh, so that that's, you know, if, you know, we're, we're here six months from now and you tell me that Japanese, the, the DOJ has raised their rates to 1% and the yen has appreciated 10% versus the dollar. I'd say that's a big risk to liquidity in the U S and in global markets. But I think we are, the BOJ is very far from that point. Okay. No, I appreciate that uh, context there, Michael. I really do. Um, cause it is, it's really significant. Cause in the end we talked about uh, treasury funding and uh, T-bill funding as well. Cause if you can borrow money for 0% and get 5% bills, uh, why, why not do that? Right. Uh, right. You know, even in, even with the fees involved, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Michael, let, let, let's get to the here and now. It, uh, we're recording this on March twenty eighth, so it's the last trading day of the quarter. Um, so, what what are some of the main takeaways, and what are some of the key trends you see sort of moving into Q two here now, and what are some of the trends you're uh, following then closely as well? Um, you know, obviously the markets have this kind of speculative tone to them. Bitcoin, gold, AI stocks, kind of the you know what some people may perceive as high beta are are really shooting up um uh, you know the s p nasdaq most of the indices are hitting record highs day after day so and they're getting very extended on a technical basis 
Uh, doesn't mean they're going to correct today or tomorrow, but I think at some point a correction and maybe in a best case scenario, consolidation is in order where maybe stocks just go nowhere for six months or three months, uh, or we get a 10, 15 percent correction. Uh, but the question is, what triggers that? And there's really nothing, you know, obviously a kind of odd unemployment number or CPI number or something could certainly trigger it. There's an exact, you know, some kind of event in the world that's much harder to predict. Um, you know, we have the elections coming up in November here in the U.S. Um, potentially, as we get to September and October and we all realize that it's either Biden or Trump, that 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 weighs on the markets because they just don't know what to expect, uh, especially I think, especially if it's Trump. Biden, you know what you're getting. Trump, you don't. So if he's leading in the polls, that may cause the market to either get more bullish or to rethink its stance. Um, but I think kind of the one the one place I have my that I'm most concerned about is liquidity. And in particular, I keep a close eye on the reverse repo program at the Fed. And there's still about 400 to 500 billion in there. That to me is excess liquidity. Until that excess liquidity is gone, I think there's there's not going to be a liquidity problem on the street. Um, and again, it doesn't it doesn't have to go to zero. It could just get down to a hundred billion, or it could be at zero for a little while. It, there's no real way to quantify liquidity, but that is a big big chunk of liquidity that's sitting there that will ultimately disappear. Um, you know, in the next few months. So that's kind of what's on my radar. And I don't know when, what that number has to be, whether it's zero, it could be 200 billion, it could be, you know, three months after it hits zero. I don't know, but that's what I'm paying close attention to. And all in kind of the money markets, the overnight markets for any signs of stress. Okay, no, fantastic, Michael. Really appreciate that. So really interesting trends in there as well. So the question now is, if I were to come to you with a million dollars, how would you allocate my money today? Just, uh, you know, make, making some general assumptions. And of course, uh, please, you know, this is not investment advice, but I'm just curious, how, how would you uh, allocate that capital right now? So we're active managers, right? Uh, we have our macroeconomic views. Some of them are not very optimistic. Uh, we appreciate valuations and that they're also not very optimistic for future returns. But we also are in the market that we're in and we have to acknowledge that. So we're largely fully invested. So if you're in a 60-40 uh, portfolio model, we have virtually 60% stocks and 40 We do like bonds a lot here. We think yields come much lower. So we like bonds. We, we have more duration than the index says we should have. But you know, again, we're active. So we're constantly paying attention to all the economic data, the macro data, and we rely decently on technicals to help us, help guide us, to, to help us appreciate investor sentiment, investor liquidity, momentum. And like, for instance, one of the things that we're closely watching is the 20 day move, moving average on the S&P. The, the market has just gone up in a very tidy line that keeps bouncing off the 20 day moving average. If we were to break that moving average, we may take a couple cards off the table. If we start getting near the 50 day, if we see some of our other technical indicators, we have some proprietary models. If they start telling us a turn is in hand, then we'll keep exiting our stock positions. Um, so the key is, uh, you know, I, right now we're pretty much fully invested, but we're very flexible and willing to reduce our holdings if need be. Um, and I think the bottom line is you have to keep your head on a swivel because you don't know where the next shock is coming from. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge the trend is upwards. And, you know, the last thing we want to be is find out that this is January 1st, 1999, not January 1st, 2000. And we sat on the sidelines while the market went from very high valuations to extreme valuations and rewarded investors with, you know, 30, 40 percent or more on their money. So it's difficult, but that's that's the job we have. That fear of missing out is still omnipresent, I think. So absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Michael, wonderful conversation. I really, really appreciate your time. Where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? 
Real Investment Advice um, has everything that I publish that Lance Roberts, my partner, publishes. We're out there every day. We have a morning commentary. You can sign up, get it for free. Uh, Lance writes more than me. I write one long, longer form article a week. He writes uh, two or three articles. Uh, we also have videos. We do a uh, radio show every day that we put out on YouTube. So you can watch that. Uh, so go to Real Investment Advice and check out all the work that Lance and myself do. Fantastic. Michael, really appreciate your time. I hope to have you back soon here, uh, maybe at the end of Q2 to see uh, you know, if some of the trends played out and uh, like how, how much your head was spinning this uh, the, you know, this coming quarter. So really curious how, how that's playing out. Really appreciate your time. And sure. uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. I hope you found this episode of, of, of interest and valuable, of course. Um, if you did, please leave a like, leave, leave a subscribe here as well. Uh, but also let us, let us know, did we ask the right questions? As, as I said, was this valuable for you? What did you take away from it? Uh, how are you positioned? Really love to know. And of course, we'll be back with lots more here this week. And uh, as you you can see we're in our studio in Vancouver and we'll be recording lots more interviews. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll be back with more. Thank you.